You know, over the course of the decades that I've taught here, the, I, the college and I have talked about maybe me giving a reading sometime or another. I gave one in 1983 when my first self-published book came out. Uh, it, I, I sponsored it myself. And I made a little flyer, and it had a little brown, brown lunch bag on it. And it said, uh, it's, it, it, it misquoted Thoreau, and it said, uh, what, what was that, uh, beware all enterprises requiring, uh, well, he said new clothes, and I said requiring you to bring your lunch. Uh, <laughs> so I had a, a brown bag poetry reading in, in the student center. And uh, there were about six faculty members, and it was really incredibly disheartening. Uh, <laughs> So I, I decided not to do any more readings here until I was the Poet Laureate of the United States. <laughs> I mean, you guys wouldn't be coming out here if I was just k <laughs> You know, I wanted, to, I wanted to begin, and Yolanda kind of touched on this tonight, uh, by pondering just a minute what I think art is from the practitioner's point of view. And I was thinking of some of the aspects of art, what we understand as art. And one is, when it's your art, you, you can't get to the bottom of it. You never exhaust it. Uh, uh, another thing is, you apply everything else that happens in your life to it. it. It enriches you. It enriches that thing that you do that's your art. Uh, and finally, you keep wanting to come back to it. That's kind of related to the others, but, but it's a little bit different. And, and I was thinking, poetry is thoroughly understood as an art, as painting is and, and, and many other things. But I'd like to emphasize tonight that teaching is an art. And I'd like to dedicate this evening, this evening's reading, to the artist teachers, current and retired, of College of Marin, of whom I am so proud. And chief among them, my life partner of 30 years, Carol Adair. chronologically, starting, starting from the beginning. Uh, it's kind of great that, that my earliest, some of my earliest poems are, are just being published now in, in the Jam Jar Lifeboat and other novelties exposed. There were a number of years um, when I was learning my craft that um, I used Ripley's Believe It or Not to, uh, I just opened it at random and, and whatever showed up I would make, make myself uh, write a poem about it. So I wrote hundreds of poems, uh, so a few of them had to be good uh, over the course of maybe like 10 or 15 years. And, and now, available to you in this beautiful new trade edition, <laughs> along with a knife, uh, 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 are, are these 15 poems. And I thought I'd read a few of them. They, they still please me a lot, I mean, the ones that I, the ones that I selected out. And this, this is such a beautiful book. Physically. The, I, I'm sure you're wondering about the jam jar itself, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, here you go. I, they always start with an epigraph from Ripley. Uh, the jam jar lifeboat, invented in 1831 by a man named Bateman, who insisted it was unsinkable, sank the first time it was tested. <laughs> It was quixotic to think the cold gray North Atlantic might be survived in a jam jar boat. It is not enough that one of something can be made to float with its lid sealed tight. One rat might survive one night on a single treadmill bottle, but even that would be a battle. 
Bateman always hated how small truths extrapolated so poorly. <laughs> he came up with really good small ones almost hourly. <laughs> This is a poem about a giant, Chang. Chinese giant wrote his name on the wall 11 feet above the floor. These things are typical of Ripley. He dwells, shall we say, upon the bizarre and the grotesque and the freakish and the extraordinary and extreme. And it brings out in me, ordinarily fond of all those things, a desire to protect those people and to see the the human in, in, the, in the creatures and people that he's dehumanized. Um, not that I think Ripley is my enemy. He's my friend, uh, because he gives me that opportunity. So Chang, once again, wrote his name on the wall, 11 feet above the floor. Again and again, he wrote the character for his name high on walls, well over door frames, until no shop or temple but said, Chang, Chang, far above eye level. If he had been a normal-sized boy, he would have been in trouble. <laughs> that boy of yours is incorrigible, the villagers would have said. They would not have admired what he did. And Chang did not admire what he did. His brushwork was rather bad. Chang, Chang, Chang. Chang, he wrote, more bored than defiant, hoping only to be laughed at by a later giant. Uh, this next poem is called uh, The Walking Stick Insect. And uh, this is a poem I dedicate to all the oversensitive people in the room. Uh, the walking stick insect of South America often loses an antenna or leg, but always grows a new appendage. Often, nature makes a mistake, and a new antenna grows where a leg was lost. <laughs> that one really gripped me. Eventually, the most accident-prone or war-weary walking sticks are entirely reduced to antennae, <laughs> with which they pick their way sensitively, appalled by everything's intensity. 